federal government says it will impose tariffs on Chinese electric vehicles, along with 25 percent duties on Chinese steel and aluminum. It's a move that is protective of Canada's fledgling electric vehicle industry, but it comes at a cost to consumers. Margaret McQuaig Johnson is a board director of the China Strategic Risks Institute. Margaret, great to, ha great to have you with us. Thanks for inviting me, Amanda. So was this the right thing to do? It does block the sale of cheap Chinese electric vehicles here. Uh, why did Canada do it, do you think? Well, I'm like others. I'd like to buy a cheap vehicle. However, um, we have a North American uh, market for autos, uh, a sector that we've developed over time with our American partners. And in fact, each vehicle on average uh, passes across the border, back and forth in parts and so on, 78 times before it's finished. So this is something that we need to do with our uh, American partners and we need to mirror their policy, which was announced in May as a 100% tariff. And this is targeting uh, Chinese vehicles because uh, they have um, uh, put extreme subsidies on the production of those vehicles. They've got overcapacity because their economy is not doing well, and therefore they're uh, wanting to keep auto workers there hmm. in their jobs. And so this is uh, something that the Canadian government's trying to uh, address. Yeah, and I mean, as you say, because the U.S. had done it, there was a sense that we we can and should stay in step with them. Similarly, with steel and aluminum, um, the Chinese have a history, and our, our minister alluded to that this week, of dumping, as we would say, in trade parlance, selling things uh, at a loss in this market, something the U.S. is very vigilant about, as, as are we. Do you think, Margaret, that we will see countervailing tariffs? In other words, will China respond or retaliate, really, in a way that might hurt, say, the grain producers of this country or some other part of our economy? This is possible, not because it's the normal thing for countries to do, but it's something that China often does in retaliation for some slight that's taken against them. Uh, in this case, uh, when Minister Jali went to Beijing recently and met with Wang Yi, the only issue that he wanted to address with her was these uh, tariffs and the potential for tariffs. And so they will not be pleased with this announcement. And it's very possible that they could slap a, a, some kind of tariff or ban on one of our products. They tried it with canola and a few others a few years ago, as we'll recall. But in that case, in, in canola, they were get, uh, getting their uh, sales because they were sending it instead to the United Arab Emirates, mm -hmm. uh, where it was turned into canola oil and sent to China. So Canada was getting that, uh, that sale uh, in any event. So in this case, you know, we did have this feeling that we kind of need to mirror the U.S. The U.S. is taking a fairly strong stance against China in general, and they've talked about other tariffs that could follow. Do you see this as a new era of a chill on trade with China? It is, uh, and it's a, a chill across all kinds of policy fronts with China. So it's certainly not just with trade. But we have to remember that uh, it was China itself that started this um, attempt to uh, control the extent to which their country saw trade into China mm -hmm. and where automakers in China used, used to be full-fledged um, sellers in the market, uh, they now have to have a 51 or more percent uh, joint venture with a controlling uh, partner being in control of that uh, of that arrangement. Mm -hmm. And so uh, they, really this uh, so-called disengagement started with China. Margaret, it's so good to have you for this. We appreciate your time always. Thanks very much, Amanda. Good to be with you. Margaret McQuaig Johnson is board director of the China Strategic Risks Institute. Time for the takeaway and the things we take for granted. 
Canada has a lot to be proud of, and our basic systems of infrastructure used to be one of them. In most cities and towns in this country, the water that came out of the tap was clean and plentiful. Road networks were extensive and in good repair. Arenas, community centers, and libraries dotted the landscape. At least that was all true 20 years ago or more. Now the people of Calgary are being asked to conserve water as critical repairs are being made to a pipeline responsible for 60% of that city's drinking water. In Ontario, brownouts and blackouts are a more frequent occurrence as aging hydroelectric infrastructure wears out and malfunctions and demand outpaces the grid's capacity. It was also demand that sent Alberta into a deep freeze at the start of the year when a cold snap sent energy consumption shooting up, causing a near collapse of its grid. And in Montreal, the state of its bridges has been a calamity for years. There's not a city or town that is immune and the vast majority of our public infrastructure is old and in desperate need of repair. It's a crisis you could spend a lot of money on, and we know that because we are spending. The feds alone have put tens of billions into various infrastructure projects in the past few years. Just not enough to put a dent in this problem. So how do we tackle the issue of public infrastructure? The real problem is that it requires the kind of long-term thinking and planning that doesn't always suit us. In this world of instant gratification, big ticket investments that don't do anything except avert a disaster, which may or may not happen, don't get a lot of public support. What we need is some leadership and initiative that will force us to accept a hard reality. If we don't fix our infrastructure, the costs of recovery after a disaster could one day be insurmountable. My takeaway, we shouldn't let the slow drip of infrastructure failure fool us into ignoring the tsunami of collapse that could be headed our way. That's Taking Stock for this week. I'm Amanda Lang. Thanks for being with us.